down to that office so the FBI could arrest me. I should have known that sort of thing could have happened because my supervisor was former FBI and she still had a relationship, so I think they were using her to keep an eye on me anyway. Speculation, but it makes sense. So time passes, um, and it's funny. And the other insanity in this case. So, so I was arrested in St. Louis. They shipped me out to Virginia. And there's really no justification to keep me in the Alexandria jail. So I had friends come to court to speak on my behalf to help me get out on bail or whatever. And one friend, good friend of mine, came up just to say support. The judge looked at her and was like, well, okay, he stayed with you. She's like, well, I don't think he left me. He's like, well, he either stays with you or he stays in jail. No justification at all. The prosecution was saying that I was going to get out and murder CIA employees. The judge was giving, cre giving, giving credence to that. Can you imagine going to support someone and the judge looks at you and say, you're going to take him in or he stays in jail? I mean, that's part of the insanity that I've been going through. And you know, I, I was away from my support base. And it was just so crazy. I mean, it was a nice house that I was staying in, but it was still like I was in jail, in prison. So time passes. I mean, that's 2011. The trial doesn't start until 2015. And so during that time, you know, I, I, I kind of look back now and say, how the hell did I get through all that? Wondering what the hell is next? What is the government doing? And in that intervening time, the issue of the reporter happened. It's like, is the government going to call him? What is he going to say? Are they going to put him in jail? During that intervening time, it was no longer about me. It wasn't the United States versus Jeffrey Sterling. It was the rising case. I was a spectator to my own trial. And there was this absolutely no regard from the media whether I was, excuse me, innocent or guilty. And then once the danger was away from Mr. Rising, no concern at all. So the trial happens. And of course, the government has been, had been fighting for the right to call and ask about his sources. Call him and ask about his sources. They want an appeal for that. But then they decided, and they were saying throughout, if we don't have a reporter, we don't have a case against Mr. Sterling. Well, then it turned out, they won the right to call the, the reporter, but then they didn't call him. So why wasn't the trial over? It wasn't even about that. I, I, I think a lot of it was about maybe them trying to get back at him. I think a lot of it was certainly making an example of me. I love my country. And to be put on trial for violating the espionage act made absolutely no sense. I think I was the fifth person ever to be charged with that. So, I mean, life is not, this, this, this part of the journey isn't making much sense to me. Uh, so the trial starts. And they're not calling it a report. It was no more than a show trial. The only thing that the government proved beyond a reasonable doubt was that I was black. <laughs> it was an incredible trial. I had worked in the Office of General Counsel at the agency, so I knew how they perform and what they do when it comes to court. The agency put on, in a public trial, so many, just an incredible amount of classified sources and methods. Case officers, current and former clandestine case officers, so the same. There was a screen to prevent them being seen by uh, visitors, but the jury could see them. Absolutely incredible. What made no sense to me was it basically was the discrimination case that I was trying to bring, but was prevented. But this is this turned out to be my discrimination case without me being able to say anything. Really being able to address that issue. Well, what was happening in the past? And the FBI on the stand admitted, well, we had no evidence. We had dropped it, but we brought it back. And one other point came up during the trial. One of those Senate staffers that I am told uh, spoke to about Operation Merlin had subsequently, after my meeting with them, 
had either quit or was forced to quit, or maybe even fired, from the Senate Intelligence Committee for leaking classified information. Two, James Lesley. But that didn't make a difference to anyone, the jury, the judge, or the prosecutors. That was a case that was going to happen. They had to make an example of me. It was nothing more than a short trial. And I was incredibly convicted on all nine counts by looking at this kind of uh, My one nightmare that I had growing up was I was going to avoid prison. I saw so many people as I was growing up who trouble with the law. Yeah, it was like prison was a badge of honor where I was going on. I was determined to not have that happen to me. And here it was. I was facing that. And um, so coming up to sentencing, just some of the incredible things that have happened in this weird journey. You know, I had reached out, and even Holly had reached out to civil rights organizations bringing up the, the travesty of the trial. Not one would even respond. The only civil rights champion that said anything on my behalf was Desmond Tutu. He wrote to the judge, and I didn't even know what he did. He wrote to the judge to be fair. And it's just, wow, no, no civil rights activist in this country would lift a hand for me. But someone in South Africa would. And that was incredible. So I was eventually sentenced to 42 months. I was facing, think about it, they had uh, maximum on each count, uh, 10 years each count, at least 90 years, something like that. Uh, the sentencing guidelines were damn, about 25 years. Uh, she gave me 42 months. That was the one time I saw the prosecutor absolutely livid. He was. He was so angry, his face was red, he was shaking. He thought, you know, he kept questioning the judge, and she had to shut him up and say, that's it. Uh, when you think about the years, the expense, the effort, the manpower, and everything for this case, and the investigation of me that had been going on since, I guess, maybe 2000, uh, 42 months. Going to prison was, uh, <laughs> it was hell. It was helpful. Uh, I had health issues there. It took the course of my wife and the thousands of supporters that she rallied to my aid to get health care in prison. Now, more things that you know, my eyes are opening up about. But, you know, it was, I didn't think I could make it through prison. I, I knew, and prison gives you a lot of time to think about your choices in life. So I was kind of thinking, well, did I do the right thing? I was even going back, did I do the right thing going to Milligan? Did I go to school? Damn, I'm in prison. How can I be in prison for doing the right thing? So I was feeling really low. But having those daily phone calls with Holly, I think we were able to talk every day for 15 minutes. And then the letters started coming from people all over the world expressing support and solidarity. People were sending me magazine subscriptions, uh, books, and tons of books. I, I was the envy of the mail call. I get mail every day. And it was just amazing. And people found out I loved Shakespeare. They were sending me so many treatises on Shakespeare. I, I, was, I was just finding a comfortable place in a very uncomfortable environment. And then, of course, me being me, I'm going to set, you know, make people uncomfortable. Holly sent me some Farsi books so I could try to keep up with my Farsi in prison. Well, they got those books in with that script that looked Arabic, and I think a lot of alarms went off because they wouldn't give me the books at first. They're like, well, you've never seen that language. So you don't know what it says. <laughs> and, you know, <coughs> send a book directly from your home to some prison. It has to come from Amazon or some vendor. I said, well, why don't you just go on Amazon and look it up? You can see exactly what it is. I, I think they finally realized the stupidity of their concerns and uh, relented and gave the books. I was a bit of a curiosity. Uh, I think 
I think inmate and staff alike didn't know what they had wanted to do with me. I think some were generally afraid of me because old CIA would be messing with him. He might do something to us or something like that. And I wasn't in prison trying to say, yeah, I'm a big man here. No, that, that wasn't me. But it was just, it was like I was kicked out of the country. I was persona non grata. And then I'm watching on the news individuals like General Petraeus, General Cartwright, getting slaps on the wrist for their indiscretions, their wrongdoings. And I just had to keep wondering, where was that same criminal justice system that put me here? I mean, these individuals lied to the FBI, reveal classified information, but they get slaps on the wrist or pardoned. So a lot of time to think about these things. But then the day finally came to get out of that hell. And Holly came to pick me up, and it was a wonderful day. And this past July, I finally came off probation. And it's like I was sitting and thinking about the time, and it had been almost 20 years that some sort of cloud had been over me, whether I knew it or not. And I was wondering, did I remember what it feels like to be free? And it's like, well, I, I don't know if I remember. But I'm going to enjoy myself and I'll try to find it. And so I wrote the book. And of course, he just he wasn't done with me. Um, I wrote the book. And of course, I didn't read when I joined. Anything that I write can be reviewed by the agency, Publications Review Board. Okay, you're going to mess with me again. Submitted the book. I said, oh. We got some issues with locations. We don't like to divulge locations. They didn't want, specifically, they didn't want me to say I was in New York. And, well, okay. I promptly sent them copies of the trial transcript where the government revealed all of that information on its own. <laughs> <laughs> they were it. The process for me took about three months. Normally, it can take over a year. Uh, but the incredible aspect that I went to trial with the CIA, Department of Justice, and all of that information given up. Uh, but I, I put that in my story, not, not to out things with the CIA, but just to tell about me and what I what I've gone through, what I went through. And with this journey, as part of the journey. And to me, the fact you know, I, have to, I, I constantly wonder what's next. Now I'm 52. Oh, by the way, I'm going to have to have my other knee replaced, but I don't think the FBI is going to be waiting for me once I recover this <laughs> one. So I hope not. Um, I don't know what's next. This, this has certainly been a hell of a journey. I, I know what I did with the things that I found along this journey, and I don't like what some of the things did to me that I found along. But one thing that has made it all worthwhile was I did stay true to myself. That has added meaning to all of this. People ask me, why, why do I sound optimistic? I have to be. I've always had hope. And if anything that you take away, for those of you who read my book, is perseverance. You keep going. There was adversity for me coming here to this university. I fought through that. And it was it enriched my life beyond my imagination. I persevered through law school. I persevered through the agency. That may not have turned out quite well, but I remain proud of the service that I did at that agency, that I served my country in that capacity. And I remain proud that I can look myself in the mirror, that I stood up for myself, that I stay true to myself. And that has what that is what has given this journey me. And that's what keeps me hopeful of the future. Uh, I've been collecting uh, rejection notices with regards to work, but it's gonna turn around. I know it will. It always has. There's always a turn along the journey. So again, if you didn't take anything from this, you keep going.
because you yourself are worth it. Don't let anybody tell you what you're supposed to do. You do what you feel you are going to do. So that's uh, my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> not to plead. That was probably one of the easiest decisions for me ever. I remember one time, and the government really wasn't even serious about taking any plea from me. I think one, they knew that I wasn't going to accept anything like that. I mean, early on, they said, well, we want him to plead to something. And I told my attorney, he's like, well, I tell him I had a book overdue once, but you know, that wasn't going to satisfy them. So they, they really had no interest in a plea. Um, I hope that's answering, I'm answering your questions, but um, would, would things have been different had I gone to different avenues? I went to the avenues that I was allowed to, um, and things didn't work out that way uh, for me. But I never second-guessed myself on any of that, because I know that's what I would have done. Having the opportunity to do it all over again, would have been the same. I uh, realize this may be a little early, uh, a little fresh still, but have you thought about anything in terms of maybe a online petition, uh, presidential pardon, anything to that degree? Um, my wife, Holly, certainly tried while I was in prison. Uh, she gathered, is it over 200,000 signatures? Uh, presented it to the White House. Uh, I don't even think President Obama acknowledged receipt of um, I Maybe that's a possibility down the road. I, I can't see, certainly, this current administration um, even entertaining that thought um, for whatever reason. I mean, there's a reality winner situation uh, that was also an espionage act related, and they're certainly not relating for her. But, you know, ridiculously five years for revealing information that turned out to be true. Uh, so maybe at some point, I guess I could petition for that. Um, I won't, I, I certainly, you know, I have that red badge now that I'm wearing in prison, convicted felon. Uh, but if in any way, means that I'm going to compromise my integrity to ask for a pardon, I mean, I won't do it. Um, time will tell. Hi. 
Um, so you speak Farsi, is that the only language you speak? Uh, yeah, I took a lot of Spanish when I was here, but it's, okay. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, sorry. How many years did it take for you to become proficient, and what are some tips for someone who's trying to learn themselves? Um, I learned, again, uh, through, through the agency I learned Farsi. It took me 11 months to be fluent. Um, to me, that wasn't a difficult language to learn. Uh, I, I think with learning any language, just immerse yourself in it. You know, the old saying is, if you find that you're dreaming in the language you're trying to learn, then you know it, uh, sort of thing. Uh, it was interesting when we were uh, training for language. Normally places, you know, you learn language, uh, say French, you're going to go to a francophone country for an immersion sort of thing. Well, for our immersion for Farsi, we went to L.A. Because at that time, Los Angeles was like the third largest Farsi speaking city in the world. It kind of didn't make any sense to me. Like, uh, I know we can't go to Iran, but there's other places that speak Farsi. We're going to LA? Really? I didn't know at that time, but it was called, you know, Air Angeles. Uh, sort of thing. But I had a wonderful experience in immersion there. Uh, just going to shops, I went to plays. Uh, one lady was chiding her granddaughter, and, you know, so it was like, look, if he can learn Farsi, why can't you? <laughs> so, uh, but you'll enjoy it. And, and when you're learning the language, I think what's also key, learn about the culture that goes along with the language. I think that helps you get an understanding and um, really speeds along, I think, your understanding and comprehension. Thank you. Any others? Lydia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is actually for Holly. Um, during, like, while he was in prison and stuff, how did you um, manage to rally support? Um, I know you talked earlier, you mentioned that it wasn't until a senator intervened that um, your husband got the proper health care uh, that he needed. I was just wondering how you, you know, what about that? So we were actually very fortunate to have um, a reporter named Mormon Solomon be at Jeffrey's trial every day. And um, afterwards, for during the trial, he wanted to speak to me, and I really said, I can't talk to you. And it felt horrible that the attorney said, don't speak to anyone. Um, the last day of the trial, and then when Jeffrey was um, wrongfully convicted, I went up to him and I apologized. And uh, he graciously said, I understand. Don't hold it against you. Uh, Honestly, we had no money. We had no idea how we were going to get back home. He graciously purchased our airline tickets to get back home. And he's just been a supporter all along. And he is the one that had me work with Reporters Without Borders and other organizations that put a petition together to try and do a pardon for Jeffrey, um, a, not a legal pardon. So Jeffrey's team was working with him, you know, doing the logistics and legality part of it. I was just trying to get my husband out of prison. And I was trying to do anything. So I wrote a 14 page letter to the president that was delivered with the petitions. Um, and the point about his health care yes, he had health issues, he had AFib. The prison knew about that. He pretty much had a heart attack in prison. They didn't do anything. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. It's still very raw. <laughs> um, yes. I fortunately had a support system. I had a person in Denver, Colorado, that went and sat outside of uh, Senator Michael Bennett's office and said, you have someone in prison that's being denied health care. We orchestrated everyone to send about 20,000 emails instantaneously to the warden and phone calls. And it kept going for a month. And then the senator intervened and said, take this man to a cardiologist. If he didn't do it, my husband would have died there. But most importantly, no one deserves that. Whether it's my husband and he worked at the CIA, people might look at that, well, he had all these you know, support systems. And, I, and he does, and he's, he's, we're grateful because you know, there's everyday people in prison that maybe didn't work for the CIA and don't get that attention that are dying in prison. The judge sentenced my husband to the prison sentence. 
it stops there. But the punishment kept going because the correctional systems think that they're to further punish you. Hi, Holly is a star story. <laughs> but, um, I've never reason why I stay positive about things. I, I know I'm an incredibly lucky man. I, I've had some wonderful experiences, even though this is, ordeal was hell. Holly stayed by my side. I met some incredible people. I reconnected with some of my fraternity brothers and others that I went to school with here. Because um, I was living in a clandestine world, and it was hard to you know, have those relationships. You know, I didn't want to lie to my friends, saying I'm in world to some place. I actually ended up, a friend of mine, fraternity brother, Bob, came out to visit me when I was living in Virginia. I don't want to work for the State Department. And he was kidding. I think he was kidding. He looked at me and he's like, no, you don't work for the State Department. You work for the CIA, don't you? No, Bob, I'm never missing Oh, by the way, Bob, you were right. <laughs> you know, just, so being in a clandestine world, you have that support system there with you. Because there's other people also undercover. So you, you have them to talk to, to discuss things with. Because when I'm undercover, the outside world was as foreign to me as the CIA itself. But then I was kicked out. And no preparation. They didn't contact or make sure do a uh, counterintelligence assay of any of my former assets or anything like that. They didn't care. They just kicked me out. All of a sudden, my tax returns, uh, my W-2s, whatever, are saying CIA. I didn't say that ever from the beginning. And I'm like, wow, what am I supposed to do now? I couldn't go back to anyone. None of my friends, and I had some good friends at the agency, none of them would have any contact with me once I started. My discrimination students certainly uh, no contact after I was fired. But uh, there's some, one former uh, agency employee, we were in the same class together, actually. We've been good friends together. So I'm, I'm an incredibly um, fortunate and lucky man that has helped me through this. Um, yeah, so I had another question um, regarding a pardon. So, current Supreme Court precedent says that um, a presidential pardon carries with an imputation of guilt. So I was wondering, as a man who still maintains his innocence and lives by the mantra of be true to yourself, would you even be interested in a presidential pardon? Um, a presidential pardon can also essentially say that this was wrong. What happened to this individual was wrong. Uh, yeah, that is the standard, that uh, that is an admission of guilt, that you did do whatever it was and you alleged to have done. Um, yeah, I, I've been thinking about that. I've, and I certainly thought about that when Holly was taking her records. My attorneys were actually resistant for Holly to do that, because, you know, well, that's an admission of guilt. No, well, no, and Holly was pointing out to them, that's not the point of this. The point of this is to be fair. And it's funny, because I'm sitting in prison. I know the efforts that Holly had failed. Then I'm listening on the news, radio, and General Carter is pardoned by President Obama. Oh, <laughs> OK. That hurt, but I didn't feel that bad about it. Because again, that, that's like an admission to get. What, what hurts me about that was a different treatment in this system and the unfairness of it. So, um, pardon, I will have difficulty with that if that pardon carries with it the automatic assumption that I was guilty. And I will never, ever accept any, anything of admitting to something I did not do. So, I know it's a tough thing to think about. <laughs> Any questions? Um, you said like multiple times like that you love this country, that you dedicated to this country, this is your country. How do you keep that mentality, I guess, when this country has also not treated uh, you well and um, has only really been a favor for straight white men? Like, how do you 
keep, I guess, a positive look or uh, continue that dedication and loyalty to this country when it really hasn't done much for you? Because I know this country can be better than that. This country is better than that. I mean, I've had, uh, especially black students that I've talked to and say, well, you, you wouldn't want us to join the CIA, would you? Like, uh, yes, absolutely join the CIA. Nothing's going to change if you're outside of it. If you're inside, you can make a difference. And that's what I felt like when I joined. It's like, okay, I didn't join the CIA with my eyes closed. I knew the past of the, the agency, but I also knew myself and that I was going to maintain my integrity no matter what. And then maybe I could, in some way, in a small way, make a change in the agency. Um, but the overall question with regard to this country, um, I, I kind of felt, again, when I was in prison that I had been kicked out. But getting all those letters from people in the country, along with the ones from overseas, that reawakened me to the America that I knew was out there. And, and that gave me a little more solace and a little more comfort. Um, and I'm maintaining that pride in this country and that desire to know that it can be better. It's better than what we've been seeing. It's better than how it treated me. And the only way to fix that is to stand up to it. We all deserve that. Okay. Um, so just a little bit of context. Uh, I was a fraternity member of uh, Jeff over here at Elkin. And uh, there's something I want you to know, um, and that is, yeah, um, when, uh, when you got arrested, I actually got a call uh, from a reporter at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I, I don't know why they called me. I was two years behind Jeff in school. I was from the St. Louis area, maybe that's why. And he just wanted, he wanted to know what, what I thought of him, what my impression was. And I've thought about that conversation a lot over the years, as I've sort of watched your journey from a distance. Because I was such an idiot. I was like, but Jeff, uh, Jeff was a great guy. Like, everybody loved Jeff. He was, you know, he always had a smile on his face. Like, well, you're really like, like, what a stupid and sick thing to say, right? And I just like, if it's okay to tell you what I wish I had told that reporter. And, and that is that it seemed to me that there was this, there was this underlying theory of the case against you that you were somehow small and mean and vindictive and you were using national security to get back at the CIA for your own selfish purposes. And I would have said to that reporter, if I had thought about it in a moment, like, that is absolutely not the gesture of the man. He is, he is strong, 